Hey folks, it's time for more low effort content. That's right, it's not actually Trek Actually, and even less than that, it's a not actually Trek Actually comment response video. Let's get started with the comments that some of you were so generous to leave so that I could then take them and exploit them and make them into a video that I will profit from and you won't. This first batch of comments is from my most recent Star Trek related video, which is a video I was commissioned to make on the Temporal Cold War storyline from Star Trek Enterprise. This first comment comes from Tobias Shaktala, who says, the future guy is basically just a stand-in for the studio execs meddling with the story. That is a really interesting way to look at it, and it gets even more interesting if you consider the fact that the studio execs who were represented by Future Guy in this interpretation got the last laugh because no sooner had Future Guy been unceremoniously dropped from the show than the show itself was unceremoniously dropped from the network. Checkmate, Star Trek! Here's one from Opinions No One Cares About. Obviously, Daniels needed Archer to go back to 2004 in Carpenter Street because he's so good at striving to put right what once went wrong. Okay, you know what? I've said before, I don't mind if people rewrite my jokes from the videos or write better jokes than the ones that I came up with. That's, I mean, it annoys me a little bit, but I'm fine. I'm willing to accept it. It's a give and take here, right? But don't you dare ever try to improve on my Quantum Leap jokes. That is a leap that I am not willing to take. That's, it's, uh, it's pretty good, though. There's one from Patrick Ginther. I always thought that the Temporal Cold War was just an excuse they used to explain away all the massive continuity errors they made because they didn't feel like doing the homework. Who knew? Yeah, and you know, because Enterprise was a prequel, that was something that some of the really hardcore Star Trek nerds who were super continuity obsessed, and oh, thank God there aren't that many of those type of fans these days, right? <laughs> um, that was something that was a knock against Enterprise from the beginning that, oh, it doesn't match up. Why is this like that when this thing in the original series was like that instead? Like, that was a, a, a nerd complaint that Enterprise had to deal with from the very beginning, just like Discovery has had to deal with similar complaints or complaints coming from a similar place um, since it began. But the hilarious thing is, like, yes, they could have used the Temporal Cold War to kind of wave off any of the the differences between the previously established Star Trek canon and anything in Enterprise that contradicted it, they they could have, they had a perfect excuse. They could have said, oh, Temporal Cold War, that's why things are a little different here, and they aren't the same, and, you know, by the time we get to Captain Kirk or Captain Picard, it, they never did that. <laughs> like... They never, I, at least not to my knowledge. If anybody watching has an I has a an example of a time when Enterprise used the Temporal Cold War as an explanation for why there was a divergence between Enterprise and a uh, a previous Star Trek show that was set at a later time in uh, in the timeline, let me know. Like, leave a comment and let me know. But I can't think of any, as far as I know. They never, ever used the Temporal Cold War to do that. And I have to give them kudos for it, because that would have been a... would have been tempted, when, especially when fans started whining and complaining about, oh, but the Romulans did... You know, and they didn't meet the Ferengi into... <laughs> like, it would have been the perfect opportunity to say, oh, Temporal Cold War, I guess Future Guy and the Suliban must have mucked around and changed something. As far as I know, they never did that. So good for them. I mean, it still wasn't that great of a story, but at least they didn't use it to appease the grouchy nerds, and I'll always respect them for that. Here's one from John Brown. Yes, time travel has always been Trek's weak spot. I personally despise every attempt except Star Trek IV. That seems a little harsh. You're entitled to, to feel that, of course, but I don't think that time travel is really the problem with the temporal cold war i i obviously I, I really like star trek 4 but i also like city on the edge of forever i like uh star trek first contact i think that's a terrific movie that most star trek stories at least most like individual star trek stories be they movies or or episodes from the tv show that involve time travel 
have been pretty good. I mean, it's there. There are fewer bad ones uh, than good ones, I would say. So it's not the use of time travel that is the problem. I do think there's an argument to be made that it was overused up to a certain point. In fact, I think there was a period um, in the mid '90s after First Contact, maybe after First Contact came out and was a, a pretty big hit, uh, especially for a Star Trek movie there was an edict that was handed down. I remember reading something on the internet about it where Berman or Braga or somebody sort of high up in the organization said, okay, that's it, no more time travel. Because like generations had had time, had had time travel and first contact had time travel. And that was the same year that there was the big Voyager two-parter where they traveled back in time to uh, 1996. And there was just a lot of time travel going on in Star Trek. And they were like, all right, Time travel is, we're good. No more time travel for a while. <laughs> and, and then as soon as Voyager's over, the very next Star Trek show has this major subplot that runs through the first three seasons that's all about time travel. So they didn't really stick to their guns on that, you know. But uh, yeah, time travel itself isn't really a problem for me because most Star Trek time travel stories have been at least pretty good. Um, the Temporal Cold War is just an exception to that, which, you know, therein lies the problem. Here's one from Ichi Nii. I felt a lack of discussion about the future man. I know it has been discussed a lot and we pretty much know what the writers were thinking, but I was expecting to see your take on it. Do you think Bad Archer could have been a good villain? Yeah, this is something that a couple of other commenters mentioned as well, which is apparently one of the discussed uh, payoffs to Future Guy that obviously they never actually did on the show was that Future Guy was going to turn out to be a future version of Captain Archer, who was reaching back in time to influence events and what have you. And they never did that. That never became a part of the show. But that was an idea that apparently was sort of the leading contender for who Future Guy was. It was going to turn out to be Captain Archer. And yet yeah, that could have been good. There's no reason why that couldn't have been good. It wouldn't necessarily have worked, but it would just depend on the episodes and the writing and the execution. A lot of it is execution. There aren't that many ideas for stories that are so bad that they can't be turned into something through a good execution, right? So whether you think that Archer being Future Guy is the best payoff to that character or not, if it was written properly, if the writers had a point to make with it, or if it was going to take the story in an interesting direction, um, there's no reason why it couldn't have worked. But we'll never know, because they didn't do it. I will say, my thought is that whoever Future Guy was, whether it would have turned out to be Archer, or whether it would have turned out to be a completely different character, and whatever his motives were revealed to be, whatever the deal wound wound up being with Future Guy. I feel very strongly, and this is, you know, this is hindsight. This is like, you know, 20 years of, of thinking about it and being able to come up with, well, here's what they should have done. It's basically armchair quarterbacking, you know, decades after the fact. Um, but at this point, I feel like the best move would have been to decide who Future Guy was by the maybe the midway point of the first season, if not before, and pay off that entire storyline and wrap that up by the end of the first year of the show. I don't think that Future Guy or that the Temporal Cold War in general should have carried beyond the first year of the show. I think that should have been the sort of, if, if they wanted, now it would have been better if they had just not done it at all. I think they should have just not done it at all. As I say in the video, I just don't think it really matches the the parts of the series that I think defined it and made it stand out from the rest of the franchise. But assuming they were going to do the Temporal Cold War, I think they should have decided who Future Guy was going to be and paid that off and wrapped it up and closed it up and resolved everything by the end of the first season of the show. Like the season finale of season one of Enterprise should have been the end of the Temporal Cold War and the resolution, whatever it may be, to the Future Guy character. And then start fresh, move on, starting in Season 2 with a completely... If you want to do another ongoing, like, multi-episode subplot, that's great. But just start fresh. Do something else. Don't keep carrying on with the Temporal Cold War. So that that is my 20 years too late uh, suggestion for how to better handle the Temporal Cold War. Wrap it up. Pay it all off at the end of the first year. Here's one from Nostalgia Brit. Don't know about anyone else, but for me, the episode Carpenter Street felt a lot like something out of the Time Track series. 
Also, regarding the ending of this video, best ending ever. Well, thank you very much for that last part, especially. I actually think the first appearance of Future Guy in one of my videos where uh, he interacts with the future version of me is a better ending and is a, a better little piece of comedy, but I'm glad you enjoyed the, the one from last time as well. I thought that was cute. It was I thought it was a nice opportunity to bring my version of Future Guy back and have him do something else. And um, So I'm glad you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, thank you for the Time Tracks reference. I used to love that show. And you're right. If you replace... To Paul with uh, Selma, the holographic computer. <laughs> I mean, that's basically a time tracks episode. Like, like uh, Archer could very easily be Darian Lambert in that story. You know, you just hack off the bit where they're on the Enterprise at the beginning and the end, and the the plot. It's totally a time tracks plot. It's there's some stuff here in the in the present or the what is the present for the viewers. Um, that is from the future that shouldn't be here. So, so the job of the heroes is to find the stuff from the future. And they even had technology that they could use to tag it so that it would be sent back to the future where it belongs. Now, Darian Lambert had his little, uh, you know, um, car key fob thing that shot little pellets at stuff that would infect it and, and send it back to the future. Um, Archer just had his little things that he could put on it. But uh, same, completely same premise. You know, there's there's people and things from the future that are here in the 20, now the 21st century, with time tracks it would have been the 20th century, but are in this era that shouldn't be here, and our hero's job is to send it back. Uh, yeah, so totally, very time tracks -y vibes, yeah. It's a shame that uh, Carpenter Street wasn't as good as a typical time tracks episode. And here's one more comment from the Temporal Cold War video. This is from Daniel Hauk, who says, Okay, now I'm really confused about your stance on continuity. Why do you care about stellar slingshots, transporter accidents, time crystals, etc.? They don't feature in the story they wanted to tell here. I think they're relevant, but I don't agree with your take on continuity, and I'm surprised you do. Yeah, I can, I can see how that comes across as a little inconsistent. I guess what I would say is that, um, first of all, my emotional investment in that argument that I make in the video where I, where I talk about, you know, why is it so important for Future Guy to steal... Uh, the space Nazis time travel technology so that he can travel back in time when he ought to be able to travel back in time himself using any one of multiple methods that we've seen in other versions of Star Trek. Um, my emotional investment in that is pretty minimal. Like, that doesn't really bother me. That was something that I noticed that I kind of glommed onto because I thought it would make a fun excuse to do a little bit of a rant in the middle of the episode, in the, in the middle of my episode, uh, just a little bit of like a comedy bit. So I'm not like super upset about it. It doesn't really bother me. It has almost nothing to do with why I think Future Guy is not such a great character or why I think the Temporal Cold War is not such a great story. Like for me, it all comes down to, as I was saying earlier, it comes down to execution. I just don't think any of the Temporal Cold War related episodes are all that good. Um, and I don't think Future Guy goes anywhere that interesting. Um, but that ties into the other thing I was going to say by way of uh, an explanation which is, I don't usually notice or care about things like that. Like, you know, well, why can't he just travel back in time using some other method? I don't usually notice that stuff or care about that stuff if I'm engaged by the episode, right? Or I might notice the inconsistency, but it doesn't, but I don't care because it's a good story. So maybe if the Temporal Cold War was a more engaging story, I wouldn't have thought it was worth mentioning. Um, but it's also possible that it's just inconsistent because it's inconsistent and, and my opinions don't uh, line up and match perfectly and, and aren't perfectly consistent with each other because I'm not a robot. <laughs> um, or may, or I'm just a huge hypocrite. Like I, e Either one is fine with me and I'm going to sleep like a baby tonight, probably. Now let's back up a little bit to the video I did back in November about Star Trek and comedy. And this first one on that video is from Darkside1975, who says, Speaking of trials and tribulations, I will forever think it should have been handled by putting Michael Dorn in the TOS Klingon makeup and acting like nothing is out of the ordinary. Multiple people have left this comment or, or have expressed this desire in the comments of this video, and I could not agree more. What a fantastic idea, and what a great missed opportunity for a joke. Like, I, I like the way they handled it in the show, where they at least acknowledge it. They have Bashir and, and Odo, you know, sort of looking back and forth between the the uh, the TOS Klingons in Worf, and they're like, 
those are Klingons? Like they made a little joke out of it. And Worf basically just waves it off and says, we don't talk about it with outsiders. They're Klingons, but it's a long story. I think that works fine. But yeah, this would have been even better if when they travel back in time, Worf just suddenly doesn't have the forehead ridges anymore. And nobody in the episode acknowledges it. Not his crewmates on the Defiant, not anybody on the space station. He he looks like Michael Dorn made up to look, give him a little Fu Manchu mustache. You know, um, he looks like Michael Dorn as a classic Trek Klingon and nobody mentions a word about it. And then when they get back to their own time at the end of the episode, he's back to normal looking work. That is such a goddamn great idea. That is such a great idea that if I had worked on Deep Space Nine, if I had been like a writer or a producer on Deep Space Nine, and I heard that idea today, I would be furious at myself for not thinking of it and doing it back then. It's such a perfect idea. It's one of the best hypothetical Star Trek jokes that I have ever heard. It's fantastic. This next one is from Patrick Dodds. I love when Trek does comedy and seriousness at the same time. That takes some finesse. Two of the finest examples is the aforementioned Deja Q, with its wonderfully earnest scene of Q telling Data that he is better than Q is. And the most criminally underrated episode of DS9 ever in the cards. This episode is the epitome of tightrope walking, as the B story is ultra serious, as it is about the eve of the Dominion War, and the A story is a witty, lighthearted jaunt that has Jake and Nog trying to find a gift, a Willie Mays rookie card, to cheer up Captain Sisko. The two stories merge elegantly together to one of the biggest smile-getting episodes in Trek history. I agree with you about that episode. I think that's a really, really good episode. And yeah, the, the A story, the comedy story there with Jake and Nog um, chasing the, the Willie Mays card and that scientist guy um, who they sort of get entangled with. Uh, and he ha that I can't remember the character's name or the actor's name, but he has some really, really funny um, lines and just takes, you know, like there's, um, when, when he gets, he, he, he kind of catches on that Jake and Nog have been following him around and he starts to think maybe they're a little too interested in him. And he says, you know, what, what's your interest in me? I haven't broken any laws except maybe the laws of nature. And he just delivers that line so perfectly. And it's broad, like it's a lot broader than uh, humor typically is on Star Trek. I and mean, even when even when humor on Star Trek gets really big and goofy, the delivery and the, the way the actors play it is usually not quite that big and broad, but it works for that episode. It's um, it's it's a really, really funny episode. I agree with you. That's it's a terrific episode. Um, and you reminded me, too, um, <laughs> because the B story there is so serious. It reminds me a little bit of Baywatch. Um, because, uh, Baywatch would, would, would often do this where there would be an A story that was just incredibly serious or, or meant to be serious. I mean, it was Baywatch, so it's all goofy and dumb anyway, but it was meant to be very serious, right? Like one of the lifeguards had had a terrible accident and suffered a, a severe spinal injury and it wasn't sure if, if he was ever going to walk again. And the B story was, you know, oh no, Mitch lost his favorite surfboard. Like it was the most frivolous thing you could possibly imagine. And it would cut back and forth from like incredibly dire life changing stuff to where's the surfboard? And and usually they never even dovetailed at all. Like there was no connection between the two stories at all. It was just really, really dark, serious shit happening at the same time as utterly inconsequential fluff. And I thought it was hilarious. But anyway, yeah, that's but to take it back to Deep Space Nine, uh, in the cards, fantastic episode. One of the great comic episodes of that show. Here's one from Birthquake Records. I've never really thought of The Trouble with Tribbles as a comedy episode. I've always seen it as more of a lighthearted episode. Well, you're wrong. I'm glad we could clear that up. Here's one from So That's Devin Tart. To me, what got me through TOS was the fact that it was so campy, mostly thanks to the wonderful ham that is William Shatner. Watching him take whatever crazy thing the writers come up with seriously just gives the entire show an endearing charm. It feels like I liked TOS a little bit more than you did because I there are certain episodes where I feel like I need something to get me through. Like there are episodes of Classic Trek that are just dire. But as a show overall, I don't feel like I need anything to kind of pull me through. 
But I agree with you totally about Shatner and what he brings to it, especially what he can bring to kind of the the sillier or or, or less dramatically satisfying episodes. And specifically, there's something that Shatner does, and he doesn't do it all the time, but every once in a while it pops up. One of his little quirks as an actor is when he pronounces a word differently than anyone else has ever pronounced that word. Like, instead of saying sabotage, like most people say it, he'll say sabotage. And nobody else ever... Who, who has ever pronounced that word sabotage? But Shatner says sabotage. And my favorite, of course, is the way he pronounces the word telekinesis, which is the most Shatnerian pronunciation of any word ever. He says it telekinesis. Beautiful. Here's one from Agent Meister. I never thought of The Voyage Home as a comedy, just a lot lighter in tone than Star Trek's 2 and 3. Great video. Thank you very much for the compliment, and yeah, I think you're right. Star Trek 4 is not really a comedy, it's just kind of lighthearted. Thanks for clearing that up. Here's one from Thomas McKnight. While I do agree that The Voyage Home is a fantastic movie, comedic or otherwise, to me, the best Star Trek movie will always be Galaxy Quest. All right, look, I love Galaxy Quest. It's a terrific movie. And I'll go with you this far. If we if we are pretending that Galaxy Quest is a Star Trek movie, and that's, that's like a joke that a lot of people like to say, like, oh, the best Star Trek movie, Galaxy Quest. Ha <laughs> ha, right? Um, if we're going to count Galaxy Quest as a Star Trek movie, I think I would count it as the best comedy in the Star Trek movie uh, filmography, the Star Trek movie oeuvre, if you will. Uh, but best Star Trek movie overall, no. I don't think Galaxy Quest... Galaxy Quest might be third place for me. I don't think Galaxy Quest is better than Star Trek II, and I don't think Galaxy Quest is better than Star Trek VI. Galaxy Quest, I, I think it's probably better... Than, than First Contact, and it's probably better than Star Trek Beyond. Um, so, yeah, I would maybe, it de depending on where I where I would put Star Trek Beyond and and, uh, and Star Trek First Contact, I, Galaxy Quest would either be third place or fourth place for me. Definitely top five. And definitely number one as far as comedy. But overall, no, Star Trek, no, I love Galaxy Quest. I love Galaxy Quest. Galaxy Quest is not as good of a movie as Star Trek 2. To me, obviously. Here's a comment from Frisky Jesus. Hey, Steve, how do you feel about the more horror-themed episodes of Star Trek? Each of the series has had a few. TOS, Devil in the Dark, TNG, Conspiracy, or Genesis, to name a few. And I'd love to know your opinion. You know, that is a really good idea for a video topic. What I should do is add something like, is Star Trek actually any good at horror, or something like that, to uh, an upcoming poll for my Patreon patrons and channel members for a future Trek Actually topic. I think I think maybe I'll do that for the next uh, the next poll that I put up, like next month. And I don't know, Frisky Jesus, if you happen to be a member or a patron, but if you are, I assume that you will vote for that topic if it comes up in the poll, right? Right? You'll vote for it, won't you? You'll vote for it. Don't you sell me out. Don't you fucking sell me out, Frisky Jesus. Now, this next batch of comments comes from my video about Data and the human experiences he may be missing. This first one is from Weatherseed, who says, I'd say of the experiences that Data is lacking, the most important is misplacing his trust in a fart. Even if that experience specifically isn't universal, it is an example of humanity in its purest form, discovering that your body cannot be trusted. I am going to go along with you on this one 100%. I do not believe that Data could ever truly know what it's like to be a human being until he has had the experience of attempting a one-cheek sneak and failing. Until he has known that heartbreak, he cannot know what it means to be human. Here's a comment from Amy Kitchens. When you compared Data to Pinocchio, I got a nightmare flash of Disney owning the rights to Star Trek, and it was depressing. I'm glad that's one thing Disney doesn't own. Okay, everybody, so Amy just jinxed it. If Disney ever buys Star Trek and ruins it, it is Amy's fault. Thanks, Amy. Here's one from Aline Fitzgerald. Simple solution is a real human volunteers for their life experience, memory and all, to be gifted to Data upon their death. He already holds a bunch of journals from the colony he came from. 
this would also be similar to Picard's experience in Inner Light. Yeah, I think that's one way you could do it. That would be a way of giving data an authentic human experience. But one of the reasons why I didn't make that one of my big suggestions in that video is that I would want Data to have his own unique human experience. Like giving him the memories uh, and the feelings and whatever from a person who had lived their entire life and letting him have those feelings and memories and experiences in his brain, that would be a great way of giving him sort of an up-close first-person observation of someone else's life. And I'm sure that would give him a lot of insight into human experience that he wouldn't otherwise have had. But it still wouldn't be his experience. So I, I was trying to find a way that we could we could imagine something that would give Data a human experience or something that is much, much, much closer to a human experience than he has had in his life up to a certain point that would be his, that would be his unique human experience alone. But other than that, yeah, that's 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 obviously a, a way to go, and it's it's a good idea. And, you know, maybe... At some point, if he if he lived long enough, Data would get around to doing that. He would find some friend of his who was, you know, getting up there in years and kind of give him a little nudge and go, hey, you know, what are you doing with your brain after you're dead? Hmm? Duncan Morris says, I love the idea of an inner light episode for Data. In fact, maybe Data would have been a better choice for that episode. Actually, living would have been an incredible experience for Data. And this comment reminded me of something else. It reminded me of another video I did a while back about sort of speculating of how Star Trek The Next Generation would have been different from season four onward if Patrick Stewart had actually left the show after Captain Picard was assimilated in the best of both worlds. If they didn't rescue Picard and it became a show that went forward, you know, for the next uh, four seasons without Captain Picard on it. So Riker would be promoted to captain, and there might be some other shuffling around of the crew uh, to make up for the absence of Captain Picard. And, of course, there would be certain episodes that uh, would have to be reimagined or just dropped altogether, and one of them would be The Inner Light, which is a classic episode that is very much a Picard show. And I think one of the suggestions I made in that video was imagine how that episode would be different if it was Riker in the place of Picard, if Riker had lived out Cayman's life uh, on that planet through the through the probe instead of Picard. But now that you mention it, maybe that would have been a better Data episode. Uh, if, if, if Patrick Stewart had left the show and Picard was gone by the time that show comes around in, what, season six, I think, is when the inner light is in? Season five or six is when the inner light uh, happens in, in, in the show. Um Instead of making that a Riker episode, make that a Data episode. Because, yeah, that it, it fits with his, uh, his character and, and would be more useful, I think, to his overall character arc uh, than it would be to Riker. So, yeah, making Inner Light a, a Data episode is a really good idea. And a lot of people left comments to that effect saying they should just Inner Light Data. But this comment specifically... Um, made me think about that connection to my other video about, you know, if you take Picard out of it completely, how how is the show different? And and making the inner light a data episode because of that uh, is a really interesting idea. So, yeah. Here's one from Poke Press. One issue I see with the data experience is a lifetime idea is it does tread awfully close to the child and the inner light. How would you ensure it was different enough to not feel like a rehash? I do think you'd have to worry about it feeling too familiar compared to the inner light. I don't think I would have any concern about it feeling too familiar to the child because the child was not told from the child's perspective. The child was sort of a thing that was happening on the ship and the other characters were reacting to it. Whereas this data story would be about data. He would be in the center of it. So I think we would have to take care that we're not repeating ourselves from the inner light. But I wouldn't worry about repeating ourselves from the child. It's a, it's a totally different structure of a story, and the point of view is is, is totally different from that. Um, I think I would of of the ideas that I propose in that video, the one that I think has the most potential is the one where Data is um, is growing basically a clone. And, and the plan is to transfer Data's consciousness into the brain of this human body that is being grown for that specific purpose. And uh, the episode then would ultimately be about 
the ethical dilemma. You know, so the so the episode wouldn't really be about data living out the human life because I think the way you'd have to go with it is data would not actually do that ultimately. It would be about data wanting to do that, and it would be about the preparation for it and the build up to it, and data grappling with these ethical um, problems of you know, is it right for me to basically overwrite? the consciousness that would be naturally in this body if it were allowed to grow and mature and, and, and exist normally? Is it, is, it, is it acceptable for me to basically impose my consciousness over top of that one just so I can have my experience? And ultimately, I think Data would decide he can't do that. So the episode isn't really about Data having the human experience. He ends up not having it, but it's, it's, um, it's driven by that desire. You know, it's the uh, the uh, incitement of the plot is that Data wants to do this and has this idea for doing it, but ultimately he finds he can't ethically justify it to himself. And I think that of the ideas, it's, it's not the best idea for Data having the, the human experience because ultimately he doesn't have it at all in this idea, but I think it's it would be the best episode. The mo it would be the best story. And so that's the one I would want to go with. If I if I had a chance to actually write one of those pitches I threw out there in that in that video, if I had the chance to actually try and make an episode out of that, that's the story I would want to go with. Um, even though it would result in data not actually having the experience, because I think that's just the best story. And also, I think it's it's different enough from those other episodes you mentioned that we wouldn't have to worry about covering too much of the same ground. Now, this final batch of comments is from my video about. Dr. Pulaski. And his first one is from Jesse Gender, who says, Apparently the secret was to give Steve a whiteboard and his energy in videos increases a millionfold. I was in stitches this whole video, Steve, almost as much as when we were on that podcast with Anita Sark... <laughs> Sorry, slipped on my keyboard. Deaf all thumbs today. Oh, so now you're stealing my bits? Jesse? You make... First of all, you're, you're insulting me. You're saying that I guess normally I'm just... I'm just low energy... I bring out the whiteboard for a gag and all of a sudden it, it boosts my energy by a million because I guess I'm just, I'm just too, I'm a little too low key and drowsy most of the time to suit you, right? And then you, and then you steal my bit. I do the Anita Sarkeesian name dropping thing and then you do, you do your version, which is really clever. And that's okay though. We're going to, we're about to be even because in a couple weeks I'm doing a video about the horniness of Star Trek. So you rip me off, I'll rip you off and then we'll just call it square. Here's one from JJM Freeze 123 I guess genetic engineering isn't against Federation law at the Darwin Station? Also, whenever I watch Riker kill the clones in Up the Long Ladder, I'm always reminded of Odo's line in that early Season 1 episode of DS9. Murdering your clone is still murder, Evil Dan. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that too. Um, and Which I believe is, I think it's the first time that Star Trek ever acknowledged that. And I remember watching that episode of Deep Space Nine Probably the first time I ever watched it, when it originally aired back in 1993. And Odo says that when he's arresting him. He's like, murdering your clone is still murder. And I was like, damn, really? Since when? Okay. You know, because up until that point in Star Trek, it definitely wasn't. <laughs> but, uh, and, um, yeah, the genetic engineering thing, uh, that... I don't know if that had been made explicit yet. Like, I know in Deep Space Nine, later on, it became an important point with Bashir's character, where they established very firmly that genetic engineering was illegal in the Federation, and they, they tied it back to uh, Khan Noonien Singh. Um, but I don't know if it had been explicitly established by that point. So it's just one of those instances where it was legal at Darwin Station, and people maybe looked at it a little sideways and didn't really approve of it, as we saw in that episode, but it wasn't illegal because the writers hadn't thought of that yet. <laughs> Here's one from Stan the Dry Bear. What's not so awesome of Pulaski and Unnatural Selection is when she's beamed back onto the Enterprise, following the brilliant and diligent work of Chief O'Brien, she thanks and shakes the hand of everyone except Chief O'Brien. Poor dude never catches a break. Well, she's not going to shake Chief O'Brien's hand anyway. She's an officer and he's non-commissioned. He's enlisted personnel. She's not going to get enlisted on her fine officer's hands. Ew. 
Here's a comment from Ace Rumble. My favorite Pulaski moment was in the Elementary Dear Data episode, where she challenges that Data would be unable to solve a true Holmesian mystery due to his lack of intuition and understanding of human nature, whereas every other crew member dismissed Data's own concerns about his lack of humanity with nonsense like, don't worry about it, or you already are, you just don't realize it yet, Pulaski was the only one to accept data on his own terms of wanting to improve himself by being honest about what she thought was holding him back and offering purpose-driven goals, making her a better friend than Jordy or Picard in many ways. That is a very positive spin on Pulaski's treatment of Data in that episode, and I am all for it because I generally like Pulaski as a character, and I'm willing to interpret it that way, but it's also quite possible that this is early in the second season, and Pulaski's feelings about Data haven't quite evolved to the point where they get to eventually, um, and she's just being a dick and trying to embarrass the cocky robot. Here's one from Lisa Croxford. I find her robophobia really parallels transphobia. She has big turf energy. It really struck me on my rewatch last year. This was another very commonly expressed sentiment by people who like Pulaski and people who don't like her and, and can't forgive her for her, her early mistreatment of data. They say that it, to them it, it reads very much like uh, how a turf would treat uh, a trans person. And I have to say that sounds... that. That sounds about right to me. I, I, that didn't occur to me before. Uh, I guess part of my privilege and, and, and sort of limitation of perspective of just being a cis person, it didn't jump out at me like that. But now that others have pointed it out, yeah, I, I totally see that. And I guess it depends on um, how much you value her her change as a character throughout the the season of the show that she was on, or how much you think she because there were how much you think she changed because. There were also a couple of people in comments to that video that said, I don't think she really changed that much. Or, or her her character development is kind of, you just sort of have to assume that it's taken place because she stops giving Data a hard time. And it's not, it doesn't really come across as though it's obvious that the writers intended that. It just sort of happens and we assume like, well, she had a character arc. Maybe she didn't. Maybe the writers just decided to write her differently and, and it wasn't character growth. It was just inconsistent writing or the writers just deciding no no we're not doing that anymore she's different now um but uh i guess it depends on is it if, if you are someone who um who notices that who reads it as turfish behavior and um whether or not you're willing to forgive that depends on you know whether or not you think that having her start that way and then end up in a different way a actually happens and b if it does happens if if it's worth having her start out that way, given how harmful those attitudes can be to people in the real world. So it's, um, it's, it's a very personal call there, I think, as to how you respond to that and how you judge her character in, in that light. Um, but yeah, I, I had not noticed that on my own, but a couple of people, more than a couple of people pointed that out. So I'm very happy to have that pointed out uh, because now that I see it, now that I've had it pointed out for me, it makes perfect sense that that is a way to read Pulaski's character. Here's one from Ewan Smith, another great video, and Ensign's Log is a really fun series too. I just listened to episode 98, A Not-So-Happy Holiday, in which Steve really gets to show off his dramatic range. Steve's character, Ensign Johnson, has a strong character arc throughout the series, where he starts off as an unpleasant, clueless asshole, and then grows into an unpleasant, clueless asshole with emotional problems. I find it frequently hilarious. I wanted to share this one because I think this is one of my favorite comments I've ever gotten about the Ensign's Log and specifically about my character on the Ensign's Log that I start out. <laughs> I start out as an unpleasant, clueless asshole, and then I grow into an unpleasant, clueless asshole with emotional problems. That is accurate, I think, and also hilarious. And also places my character from the Ensign's Log in a proud literary lineage because, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that is the exact same character arc of pretty much every dramatic protagonist in Shakespeare. So, and finally, last comment of this bunch, last comment of this video is from Roger Wakefield, who says, Dr. McCoy did get called out once in a very powerful scene by Spock himself in All Our Yesterdays, as Spock is reverting to 5,000 year past Vulcan norms. McCoy, now you listen to me, you pointy-eared Vulcan. Spock, I don't like that. 
I don't think I ever did, and now I'm sure. Loved Nimoy's portrayal of a man who's been pushed too far for too long, who has swallowed all his anger and resentment, and can't, won't do it anymore. I had completely forgotten about that scene. When you pointed it out in your comment, I remembered it instantly, and I can hear Spock delivering those lines to McCoy. But for whatever reason, when I was writing that video, um, I, I just blanked on that. I had not remembered that exchange between McCoy and Spock, and I just assumed that McCoy had never been called out explicitly on his racism towards Spock, but that is a great example of that exact thing happening. And I think it's too bad that by the time, because All Our Yesterdays happens and then uh, the series ends uh, not too long after that, I don't think, um, and then uh, 10 years go by and we get back, we, we bring the characters back in the movies and McCoy has apparently not been altered <laughs> <laughs> by that exchange with Spock at all. Like, he hasn't learned anything. He now knows that Spock doesn't like it because Spock told him so to his face. He said, I don't like when you do that. I've never liked it. And McCoy still does it. So it, it actually makes McCoy into an even shittier character. Uh, a, a shittier person, not 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 a shitty character, but makes him into a, a, a worse friend to Spock. Because now we can't say the excuse of, well, Spock always, it's like banter. They just, you know, they go back and forth. Like, no, he knows that Spock doesn't actually like it. And he still does it. So, you're a bad friend, Leonard McCoy. You're a great character. You're one of my favorite Star Trek characters ever. I think you are my favorite classic Star Trek character. But you're a bad friend. At least to Spock. So, shame on you, Bones. Hey, here, Bones is, I don't know if you can't see Bones. He's, he's not in the shot, but he's behind me right here. Here's, here's Bones. Right here. That's Bones. Shame on you. Shit, you know what? No, fuck this. You know what? Spock's right here. Here. You are going to apologize. Look at him. Look at him. Spock, Bones has something to say to you. Okay? Go ahead. I'm sorry I called you a pointy-eared son of a bitch. Oh, not, uh, that doesn't sound sincere, Bones. Leonard, come on. My words were very thoughtless and hurtful, and I did not respect your basic... I hate this. This is stupid. McCoy? I'm sorry, Spock. Really. Truly. I'm sorry. You deserve better from me, and I promise from now on you'll get it. All right, cool. We done? I think we're done. Patreon.com slash Steve Shives, or click the join button if you want to uh, become a channel member. Either way, patron or member, great way to support the channel. One dollar or more per month really helps me continue to do what I'm doing here. Uh, Five dollars a month or more as either a patron or a member gets you a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. Membership or patronage at any level, and you get to vote in the polls to choose upcoming Trek Actually topics, and also you can submit questions ahead of time for Ask Away, which is every two weeks. Um, and you can ask about anything. It doesn't have to be Star Trek stuff. It's uh, ask me anything about anything. Um, don't forget the Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast uh, that is linked in the description. And also don't forget Trek Reluctantly, the uh, watch along series that I do with Dana, where we watch uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Um, and we watch together, cue it up on your end and we'll watch the episode together and we'll talk over it while we're watching it, which, you know, possibly enhances the viewing experience. I don't know. We'll see. Anyway. Uh, and that's also linked in the description. So that's it, everybody. Thank you all for watching. Thank you so much for the comments. Um, keep them coming. And uh, that's it. See you next time. Bye, everybody.